Good morning. It's great to be here again at the policy conference. Everyone has heard the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. When it comes to our region's ed education system, our approach should be, if it don't work, we need to fix it. And clearly, our education system needs some help. Unless we demand better schools, our region, and more importantly, our children are never going to reach the full potential. At PNC Bank, we have a long commitment to supporting education and ensuring our students and our customers enjoy success in life. In 2004, we created Grow Up Great program, a $350 million multi-year initiative to help children, particularly in underserved areas, to get ready for life. We're fortunate in this region to work with partners such as Roy Roberts, the Detroit Public School Emergency Manager, and Detroit Parent Network. This is the same commitment why two years ago, if you remember, we brought Jeffrey Canada up to the island to really start this conversation in a big way, especially at the preschool level. And that's why we're really honored today to be having our keynote speaker, Michelle Ree. After being named Chancellor of the District of Columbia in 2007, Michelle gained national recognition for efforts to turn around arguably one of the nation's worst performing school districts. Under her leadership, the 47,000 schools and 128 school districts, I'm sorry, 47,000 students, that would be a lot of schools, wouldn't it? 123 school district increased enrollment and graduation rates for the first time in 40 years. Today, she continues to inspire thought-provoking discussions through her work with Students First, which is mobilizing parents, teachers, students, and administrators in this very important effort. Students First has been active in Michigan, advocating for education reforms that change and challenge the ways things have been done, and really truly putting students at the first part of that conversation. I think we would all agree that while we might not agree on the how, we all know that this really needs to be fixed and needs to be addressed right now. I just want to point out in a really neat little uh, factoid, Michelle's middle name is Anne. Uh, she was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, grew up in Toledo, so she does have Michigan roots, so to speak. On behalf of PNC Bank and its uh, 4,500 employees in the state of Michigan, I'm happy to welcome to center stage, Michelle Ree. Thank you for having me here today to talk about what I believe is the most important issue that is facing our nation today, which is the state of our public education system. Uh, and believe it or not, there is a little bit of controversy around whether or not uh, our public schools need to be fixed. There are lots of people out there these days who say, oh no, uh, we're not having a problem with the public education system, it's just certain schools in certain areas. Uh, but I would argue uh, much something much, much different Different, which is that we are facing a crisis as a nation, not just in our public schools, but in terms of what our nation stands for that we have to address. But I want to share uh, a few facts with you to, to start off with. Um, first of all, the children who are in school today will be the first generation of Americans who will be less well-educated than their parents were for the first time in the history of our nation. That will be the case. The College Board uh, released the SAT scores last year for high school seniors and said that they were the lowest SAT scores in the history of the administration of that examination. Our country right now is 14th, 17th, and 25th uh, internationally in reading, science, and math. Uh, and we have more than doubled, almost tripled, the amount of money that we are spending per child on public education in our nation today, and yet the results have remained pretty stagnant. So for anyone who wants to argue that we don't have a problem, you're absolutely wrong. And as, as business leaders and civic leaders, you know this firsthand. A recent survey show of, of uh, employers showed that 50% of employers said that they could not find applicants in their candidate pool who had the skills and knowledge to fill mission critical jobs. So we have a huge disconnect between the kinds of students that our system is producing and what the needs of the workplace are. And we have to, we have to um, uh, help to, to solve that disconnect as a, one of the most urgent things that happens in our country. 
So I am of the camp that there's a lot to be done, uh, that our system is broken right now, that it's not serving all kids well. And so the next question that I usually get asked is, so what should we do about it? And I was out on the porch earlier doing a number of um, TV and radio interviews, and the, the one question that was pretty consistent in all of the interviews is, okay, if you could only do one thing in education to fix the system, what would it be? And I hate that question, because if there was one thing that we could do, we would have done it a long time ago and it would have been fixed, right? Uh, so uh, there is no one silver bullet solution, but I am going to talk today about three things that I think that we could do as a nation, in fact, that we must do as a nation if we are going to change the circumstance for children in America today. So the first thing is that we need to begin to honor the teaching profession and respect teachers for the incredibly <laughs> difficult job that they have every day. I say this, having, I come from a family of teachers, I was a teacher myself, and I know that teachers' jobs uh, are not particularly well respected in that when I was in DC, uh, I used to walk around the streets all the time, I was the chancellor there, and people used to stop me all the time and say, oh, you have the hardest job in the entire city. And I always used to say, no I don't. This job is actually a walk in the park compared to what it takes to be an effective teacher in one of our classrooms. But there is an incredibly alarming conversation going on uh, in this country today that revolves around whether or not teachers matter. There are people out there who say, well, when children come to school from uh, you know, situations of poverty, there are so many challenges that they face that there's nothing really that, that teachers can do, teachers in schools can do to make a difference. And that is absolutely incorrect. So I'm gonna share with you a quick little uh, story from my time in DC. When I was the chancellor there, uh, I liked to be out in the schools as much as I could. And uh, after my first few visits out to schools where my staff would tell the school that I was coming, et cetera, I learned my lesson about how to do school visits well. And what you cannot do is tell the school that you're coming ahead of time. Because what would happen is I would you know, drive up to the school and the, 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 there would be a pep rally and the marching band and the dance squad would be out there. And I'm like, well, the kids are supposed to be in class learning. I don't want to see all this. So I started doing unannounced visits to schools. Uh, and would just come in, wouldn't even check in at the front office, would just walk into classrooms because I wanted to see what was happening every single day when I wasn't there. So there was this one particular school in one of the uh, most troubled areas of the entire city where murder rates were extraordinarily high, violent crimes, et cetera. Picked a particular school. Across the street from the school was a liquor store and a nightclub. As I was walking up the front walk to the school, it was littered with you know, broken beer bottles and cigarette butts and syringes. It was the picture of urban blight. So I walk into the school, I chose to go down the left hallway first, uh, just chose a random classroom, walked in, and what I saw was absolutely amazing. It was a group of about 30 kids in the classroom, and they were absolutely spellbound. Their attention was fully placed in the teacher in front of them. She was this enthusiastic woman, she was bounding around the classroom, and they're all, uh, they're all transfixed on her. So I'm sort of listening to sort of figure out what's going on, and I'm picking up through context clues that the children were um, in the middle of a unit of learning about Greek mythology, and they were reading a chapter book to go with it. And they were at the point, the book was about a group of kids their age who had traveled back in time, back to the time of Greek gods, and they were at the part of the story where they were trying to figure out, you know, they'd have their adventure, how do we get back home? So the teacher looks at the kids and says, please look up at the posters I have around the room. And she had created different posters of each of the Greek gods and what they were the god of. She said, and tell me, if you were one of these kids and you could only choose one god to call on to help you travel back in time, which god would it be? So I look around at the posters, I get my answer. The first kid raises his hand, he said, I would choose Zeus because Zeus is the god of gods He's the boss of everybody else. If he tells you to do something, you have to do it. He said, so I figure just cut out the middle man and go straight to the big guy. <laughs> I was like, that was a pretty good answer, right? Second child raises her hand. She said, I would choose this God. It was the God of women, children, and families. She said, these are kids we're talking about. She's the God of children. She got to take care of her peeps. So I would choose her. That's another good answer, right? 
Third kid raises his hand. He said, I would choose this God. It was the God of art, music, and literature. So I'm thinking in my mind, okay, kid, that was a total misfire, right? <laughs> then the kid says, as you'll remember from the book, the way the kids got transported back in time is because they had dug up an old Greek lyre and they strummed the strings of the lyre. He said, so I have to figure if they have to go back, it has something to do with the lyre, so they should call him the god of music. I thought, huh, that was pretty good. <laughs> These kids gave five or six unbelievably creative and well thought out answers before someone came up with my ever lame answer of the god of travel. <laughs> And I thought, this is exactly what you want to see in a classroom. The kids were all engaged. They were using their critical thinking and analytical skills. They weren't necessarily all, you know, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer. It was alive with learning, absolutely what you would want your own children to experience. So I'm happy. I walk out of that classroom. I walk into the classroom directly across the hall to the exact opposite situation. So in this classroom, I open the door, I almost run into the teacher who is standing in the doorway, screaming at the top of her lungs. She's yelling, everybody be quiet. I've told you all morning that you need to be quiet. You're not listening to me. I have no idea what's wrong with you children. She said, I'm going to count down from 10. And by the time I get to one, I want everyone's mouths closed. So then she starts, 10, <laughs> 9, and she starts flicking the light switch on and off. Eight, flick, flick, flick. Seven, flick, flick. Six, flick. And she says, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And you look at the kids and they're like, we're waiting too <laughs> for something to happen. I was in each of these classrooms for no longer than 10 to 15 minutes a piece. And I can tell you that these two groups of children both of whom came from the same downtrodden community, who came into the same dilapidated school building every day where there was rainwater leaking through the roofs and ceiling tiles falling on their heads. These two groups of children were getting a wildly different educational experience because of the adults who were in front of them every single day. You cannot tell me that teachers don't matter. They matter tremendously. And we as a country need to really, really think about what we do to ensure that there's a highly effective teacher in every single classroom every single day because it absolutely makes a difference. And I want to say that Michigan, <laughs> Michigan has begun to make some very important strides towards this. Uh, Lisa Lyons has uh, recently ensured that a, uh, a bill that would recognize and reward the, the best teachers through a merit pay, performance pay system for teachers uh, just got out of committee. Those are the kinds of policies that we have to be putting in place to ensure that teachers are valued in society in the right way. So making sure that we're respecting teachers is the first thing that we need to do. The second thing is that we need to recapture the American spirit, the American competitive spirit. Because I will tell you that as a country, we have gone completely soft. Let me tell you what I mean by that. We spend more time in this country trying to make our children feel good about themselves, that we have lost sight of taking the time necessary to actually make them good at anything. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I, I am the mother of two uh, daughters. I have a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. My two daughters play soccer. My two daughters suck at soccer. <laughs> They're terror. I mean, they have, they have inherited their mother's unfortunate athletic abilities. And when you see them out on the field, it's, it's, it's kind of painful. But if you were to go into their bedrooms today, you would see trophies and medals and ribbons and plaques. I mean, if you came from another planet and you, you sort of landed in my house, you would say, Michelle Ree is raising the next Mia Hamm. <laughs> I assure you folks, I'm not. So I tried to talk to my daughters about this. You know, I sought my younger daughter, Olivia, down. I said, baby, you are not so good at soccer. I said, if you want to get good, 
then it's gonna take a lot of work. 90 minutes a day, you gotta be kicking the ball up against the wall, you gotta be running sprints, you know, kicking the ball into the net. And even after you do all that, I still can't guarantee you're gonna be any good because you have my DNA. But that's what it's gonna take if you wanna be great. This kid looks at me like I'm from Mars. Like, lady, do you need me to bring some of the medals down so you can see what they say, my name on them, right? This is the problem that we are facing today. I was talking not too long ago to a well-known philanthropist uh, down in Texas. And uh, he said to me, he said, you know, what the, I don't, I don't swear, they swear a lot in Texas. He said, what the bleep is going on in America today? He said, a couple months ago, he said, I had to go to my great grandchild's summer camp awards ceremony. He said, this thing lasted for two and a half hours. He said, it got so bad that by the end of the ceremony, it sounded like this. The next award goes to the best 10-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy named Bobby who's wearing shorts today. And Bobby would run up to the stage with his arms over his head, and his parents would be taking pictures. He said, I could tell by looking at most of those kids that they were just average. He said, why do we have to spend two and a half hours trying to convince everybody that they were the best? I am telling you that we are not doing the children of our nation any favors by celebrating mere mediocrity and participation. Because I can tell you firsthand, that's not how they operate in Korea. Right? In Korea, they, you get a ranking in your class. You first grade, you know whether you're number 70 or number one, and your parents know, and everything is about how do you get better. If we're teaching our kids that just by showing up, you're doing great, we are not giving them the skills that they need to be able to compete in the global marketplace. So we have to regain our American competitive spirit. There is no doubt in my mind that we can do this as a nation. We just have to dig deeper into what we stand for as a country. And, and if you look at some of the policies that, uh, that, that Michigan as a state is thinking about today, they actually tie back to this, right? Things like, um, should we use letter grading? Something that um, Senator uh, Pablo is, is, is pushing right now. Should we use letter grading to grade our schools? And a lot of people will say, well, well, we don't wanna make schools feel bad if we give them a bad grade, if we give them an F. It's not about making them feel bad, it's about being clearer with the public Right, with the taxpayer from Michigan about what kind of return on investment we're getting for our dollars. And if the schools are not performing, then you deserve to know. There's, a, there's another issue that's come up, the, 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 the common core curriculum, which the vast majority of states across the country have adopted. And uh, I've heard some, some recent uh, rumblings uh, from folks who say, well, we don't want, we don't like it when the federal government is telling us what to do. That doesn't feel good, we don't like that. And what I say to that is, you know what you should not like more than the federal government telling you what to do? You should not like the fact that China is kicking our butts right now, okay? Don't worry about the federal government and the Korean War. The bottom line is that the kids in China in math are at number one. The kids in America in math are at 25. We should be ashamed of the fact that we have that kind of a disconnect between where our children are performing and the Chinese kids are performing. If we want to rectify that situation, we are gonna to have to have an internationally benchmark set of national standards. So get over all the we feel bad about the federal government and start feeling bad about the fact that our kids are not competing globally. So that's the second thing. We gotta get more competitive. The third thing, and this is absolutely critical, is we have to begin to see education as a bipartisan issue, an issue that all of us can come together around. And I, and I say this because education of all of the public policies out there has become more polarized than potentially anything else. And I see it firsthand. And I, I have lived this firsthand, so I'll, I'll tell you a quick anecdote on this. I am a lifelong Democrat. I was uh, born here in Michigan, I was raised in Ohio, very sort of you know, supportive of unions, et cetera. Um, and so as a Democrat, I always had very clear thoughts about what education reform should look like and what it shouldn't look like. 
And where I drew a very bright line was around the notion of vouchers, right? My party, Democrats, we don't like vouchers because it takes money away from the schools that need it the most and only a few kids can get them and what about the rest of the kids? I bought into all of those arguments. So when I got to Washington DC as the superintendent there, there was actually a publicly funded voucher program in place that gave vouchers to low income kids. And that, uh, that program was up for reauthorization. And people said, well, we want you to weigh in. You're the highest ranking uh, you know, government official having to do with education. You tell us what you think about this. So I kind of knew where I stood and what I thought, but I didn't want to make any rash judgments. So I decided to go out and, and listen to people who wanted to participate or who were already participating in the voucher program, et cetera. And what I heard was incredibly interesting. I met with parents across the city the vast majority of whom were young, single mothers. And these mothers had done everything that you would want a mother to do. So first, they would research their neighborhood school and find out, oh my goodness, only 10% of the children at this school are on grade level. That means my kid has a 90% chance of failure if they go to this school. It's not a good enough for my kid, right? So then they would do the second best thing, which the, the, we, the school district would tell them to apply through the out-of-boundary lottery process to try to see if they could win a spot at one of the high-performing schools across town. Well, inevitably, they would lose because there were thousands of people applying and only a handful of spots at these great schools available. So then these mothers would come to me and they'd say, well, now what should we do? And as I looked these mothers in the eye, sitting face to face with them, none of them wanting anything more for their kids than what I want for my own two daughters, I thought, oh my goodness. Who am I to stop this lady from taking a $7,500 voucher, which, by the way, was a whole lot less than what we were spending in the district per kid, and letting them go to a, say, Catholic school down the street from them and getting a great education? I just could not, could not do that. So came out in favor of the voucher program. People went nuts. You know, my fellow Democrats, well, you're going against the party, and people, even people who supported me. They were the ones who were sort of my biggest critics. They said, we actually believe in you, Michelle. We think that, that for the first time in a long time that you have the ability to turn this school district around, but you have to give yourself a chance. You have to keep the kids in. You can't let them and the money go elsewhere, et cetera. And I look at these people and say, see, here's where you're wrong. My job is not to preserve and protect and defend a system that has been doing a disservice to children. My job. My job is to make sure that every child in this city gets a great education. And I am agnostic as to the delivery mechanism. So I try to bring some of my Democratic friends and colleagues along on this. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I was sitting with my friend the other day who is actually a teacher. Uh, and we were having this whole voucher argument. So I you know, laid out my, my, my case. And she looked at me afterwards and she said, yeah, no. So I'm still not buying it. It's okay. So let me let me try one last thing. I said, did you watch the movie Waiting for Superman? Did anybody in the room see Waiting for Superman? Okay. She said, yes, one of my good friends was in it. I said, great. So if you haven't seen the movie, you should watch it. But there's this incredibly poignant scene in the movie where this little girl, Bianca, can't go to school because her mother has fallen behind on the tuition payments. So she's sitting at the window and her you know, tears rolling down her cheeks. So I said to my friend, little Bianca, I said, she could not go to her kindergarten graduation because her mother owed $500 to the school. What did you think about that? And my friend said, it was a travesty. It was heartbreaking. It was an injustice. She said, I wanted to write that check myself. I said, right, honey, that would be a voucher. And the, the point of this is that if we stopped thinking about things in terms of the political terms of it and just thought about things in terms of the children, we would actually make very different decisions. Let me use another example here uh, because there are a lot of elected officials here at the conference. So I'm going to pick on you for a, a moment. Um, I have found, he said, please do. Uh, I have found um, that there is a huge disconnect often between uh, what people uh, as legislators decide they want to do kind of for public policy writ large uh, and what's in the best interest of kids. So, so when I was in DC, we, as many states and jurisdictions were, were under, uh, at one point, a, a severe budget crisis. And um, it required that I had to lay off some teachers. 
And so we decided that if we were in this unfortunate situation that nobody wanted to be in, uh, that we might as well do it in a way that was going to ensure that we disrupted the schools the least. This district had always done layoffs based solely on seniority, and we thought that's just not good practice. So we wanted to do the layoff by quality instead. Uh, so we ended up uh, identifying, you know, about 250 of the um, least effective teachers in the district, um, and we laid those folks off, and it became this entire sort of controversy in the city. And the elected officials got very riled up, and I was, you know, sitting with one of them one day, and he's making sort of a big show of saying, I am demanding that you reinstate each one of the 266 wrongfully terminated teachers today. And I said to him, I'll tell you what, you have four children, none of whom attend the DC public schools. I said, if you agree to bring one of your kids into the system and allow them to be taught by one of the ineffective teachers that I just laid off, then I will give that teacher their job back. And if you bring all four of your kids back, I'll bring four of the teachers back. You can get your aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews, kids, as many people in your family as you can talk to coming back into the system and are willing to have taught by one of these ineffective teachers, I will give each one of those teachers their job back. Needless to say, he did not take me up on that offer. We live in a society. We live in a society in which our public policy makers oftentimes want to create policies for other people's children that they would never, ever accept for their own. So, My point is, if you are willing to have your kid in a failing school in inner city Detroit, then you can be against vouchers and you can be against the EAA and all those things. But if you have your child taken care of and tucked up in a Tony private school or a high performing school somewhere, then you cannot deny the same access that you are giving your kids to other people's children. That's the bottom line. So in closing, let me just say that I believe that public education is supposed to be the great equalizer in our country. It is supposed to be the thing that ensures that it doesn't matter if you're black or white, rich or poor. We have public schools in this country so that every single kid can have an equal shot in life. If you work hard and you do the right thing, you can live the American dream. That is not the reality for the vast majority of children who are living in inner cities in our country today. The reality for them is that if you look, if you live in Bloomfield Hills versus if you live in Detroit, you're getting two wildly different educational experiences. And that, in my mind, is the biggest social injustice imaginable. We live in a country today, believe it or not, this, this surprises people, America is close to the bottom internationally on social mobility. Which means if you are a child who was born into poverty in this country, the likelihood that you will ever be able to escape poverty is not high. That, that goes against everything that we stand for as a nation. Every ideal, every value, every virtue that we hold as America is exactly counter to that. We, are say, we need to say to kids, you can do anything you want as long as you go to school and you work hard. But in order to make that a reality, we need to make sure that every single child has access to a high quality education because they attend a high quality school. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome WDET radio host, Craig Fowley. Well, that'll get people talking. <laughs> uh, thank you for giving us the time uh, sitting down and talking about this. And I was really fascinated by uh, your discussion, especially when you talked about this issue of honoring the teaching profession. Uh, just so people know, I'm married to a teacher, charter school teacher in Detroit, 20-year um, veteran of the teaching profession. And to be honest, she's feeling as if there are a lot of people that are denigrating what she does for a living. <coughs> you, you, you talked a little bit about that. It seems one of the challenges that you have, though, with Students First is, you, you talk about honoring the teaching profession, but to sell what it is you're trying to sell in terms of reform, 
don't you in some way almost have to imply that there are a lot more bad teachers out there than maybe there are? No, absolutely. I think that everybody acknowledges the fact that, that um, there are, I mean, hundreds of thousands of incredibly effective teachers out there who do heroic things for children every day. And I think that equally people would say that there are some people who are in the profession who shouldn't be there. In fact, what I would say, and this is based on my travels across the country, the group of people who are least tolerant of ineffective teachers are effective teachers. It drives effective teachers absolutely crazy when they have a colleague down the hall who is not pulling their weight. Because when you inherit that person's group of kids and they didn't do their job, then you have to do two years worth of work in one year. When they see their union dues going to um, defend people that they themselves are saying, I, I don't want you know, my students in that person's classroom, it, it really does frustrate them. So the notion that we have to acknowledge the fact that there are many, many high performing teachers in the country, but there are some low performing ones, that's not news to anyone. Well, so, so let's talk about how we define then an effective teacher and what measuring stick we do sort of use. I mean, that's, that's been at the center of a lot of debate here in Michigan. How do we determine what constitutes yeah. an effective teacher? Yeah. So I think that when you look at what, uh, what makes a great teacher um, and what we would advocate in terms of uh, an evaluation system is very similar to what the state here has adopted in terms of a framework. One, you want to look at student achievement growth, right? You want to look at the kids when they came into that teacher's classroom, look at them when they left the teacher's classroom, how much did they grow? But you also want to be able to control out for the factors that are outside of the purview of the teachers, things like special education status and you know, ELL status, et cetera. You should be looking at observations of classroom practice, right? People going into that person's classroom and watching how they're interacting with kids, looking at their lesson plans, et cetera. Uh, a new thing which I think is very promising is that they have found recently that student input into teacher evaluations is actually very highly correlated with teacher performance, right? So the kids tell you, we see them every day, we know who's effective and who's not. So student and, and, and teacher, um, as student and parent feedback is important as well. I think though that um, the, one of the questions that remains in terms of the public policy debate, which uh, raises a lot of consternation is, well, if you put in place a new evaluation system that finally begins to differentiate between teachers, then what do you do when you identify ineffective teachers? Right? And we faced this challenge in DC uh, when we put in place our new evaluation system. And we were having this big debate about, OK, so if we identify somebody as ineffective, then what should we do? What should the consequence be? And many on my staff were saying, well, you know, it is our job as the employers to invest in our workforce. So we should you know, put extra professional development dollars into their practice and let them you know, try to improve for three or four years. I always looked at that from the perspective of a mother who had two children in the public schools. And I thought, you know, if we're going to take somebody who has been identified as ineffective and make the decision to put them in the classroom the following year, then I have to be OK as a mom knowing that one of my two kids could get that teacher. And let me tell you, I am not OK with that. Nobody in this room would be OK putting their kid in the classroom of somebody who had been deemed ineffective. So I thought, if I'm not willing to put my, ch my own children in that person's classroom, then I'm not going to make that decision for any other parent in this city. And again, I think this goes back to what are we prioritizing? If we are prioritizing the privileges and due process and rights of adults ahead of what's right for kids, then we would keep those kinds of policies in place. But if we are going to do what is inevitably in the, right, in the best interest of kids, then we would end up with a very different policy agenda. Well, let's talk about the difference, though, between ineffective and inexperienced. Because in your memoir, you talk about your first year as a teacher and, and really sort of being lost yeah. a bit, and then the changes that were made over that early part of your career. What needs to be done? Because there's always going to be rookie teachers in the yeah. classroom that are in that exact same position you were. They yeah. may not be effective in those first yeah. couple of years. So what the research shows is pretty clear, which is that the first two years is when a lot of the learning happens. And then by the third year, teachers pretty much plateau in terms of their effectiveness. Um, so we absolutely need to take into account the fact that there's a learning curve. But what you want to be able to see is that there is growth happening. So I wasn't a, a, a hugely effective teacher my first year, particularly at the beginning of the year. But I think that what anybody who came into my classroom would say is by the end of the year, they saw a huge difference. 
uh, and that's got to be part of what's happening. There are people out there who may have the will to want to get better, may not have the skill initially, but if when given professional development, you are beginning to see changes in their practice, and that's why classroom observations have to be a part of the evaluation process, because if you're seeing the trajectory change, then you've got to take that into account. This is a profession, though, that loses a lot of people early on. They make it a few years, they decide they're either not into the profession, mm -hmm. it's too difficult. Uh, does there need to be a faster development period to, to determine which of those people are most likely to not be there a couple of years from now? Because it seems to me that there's got to be a way to encourage those that actually have the tools to do the job, to stay in the profession, because a lot of them are leaving for money reasons, whatever else. Well, I think that if you look at the reasons why people leave the profession, uh, you know, it's not necessarily because, well, you know, people weren't helping me sort of professionally develop. We lose a lot of the high achievers out of the profession. And I think there are a lot of things that we have to do uh, to help solve that problem. One is, I think, the kinds of laws and policies that we put in place for what kind of profession we are creating. I am, so I am married to uh, Kevin Johnson. He is the mayor of Sacramento, but he is also a former NBA player. And my husband is a little obsessed with the NBA playoffs right now. Uh, uh, I, I'm watching way more ESPN than any woman would like to. Um, so the other day, we were having this discussion in my house, and I said, it is absolutely ridiculous to me that these men get paid $12 million a year to dribble a ball around this little room. I said, the best teachers in this country should get paid $12 million a year because we actually know what value they are adding to society. But think about how skewed the sort of values of this society are when we're paying those folks $12 million, and yet we're not paying our most highly effective teachers nearly enough money. And so I think compensation, but really sort of the value and respect that, that teachers get in society is something that we've got to shift. So it, it certainly sounds, though, as if you're suggesting there's a difference between incentivizing good teaching and penalizing bad teaching. Because a lot of the approach that, that we were taking before with, say, uh, No Child Left Behind, where mm -hmm. if you don't meet certain performance mm -hmm. benchmarks, there could be some fiscal penalties led to a lot of teaching to the test, which seems mm -hmm. to be uh, a, a problem in our schools right yeah. now. So here's what I'd say. You, there's got to be there's got to be a little both. Do you want to incentivize uh, really good progress? Absolutely. Um, do we also want to say, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's penalizing. I would say that when we tell ineffective teachers that they can't be teachers anymore, we're not, say, we're not advocating that we throw them in jail, right? We're just saying that you cannot have the privilege of teaching kids. And that's a paradigm shift, because right now in the teaching profession, it's like, I have a right to a job, right? And in many states, it's like, you, you, you have to meet criminal standards in order. And even sometimes when you meet criminal standards, you still can't be fired uh, from a job, even if you are not doing good things for kids. That, you don't have a right to anything. Teaching our children is a privilege, and a privilege that should be reserved for people who we know are professionals who can move academic achievement levels. Uh, but what about school management, though? Because, uh, again, district funding at times was tied to professional performance on standardized tests for a long time. And we did see an instance in Atlanta, for instance, where there was a very widespread cheating scandal that took place. If you have that sort of perverse incentive in place, or backwards incentive perhaps, what is to stop people from doing whatever it takes to, to preserve that funding what, and what leading to that situation? What is to stop people is the difference between right and wrong. Right? There is a huge incentive for people to go and rob a bank because you can get a whole lot of money. That is not the right thing to do. Uh, I, I am a huge believer in educators. I believe that the vast majority of educators in this country would never, ever compromise their personal or professional integrity and cheat on a test because they know that that would be cheating kids. So are you going to have a handful of people who make the wrong decisions? Sure, you may have that. But then you have to make sure that the systems that you put in place are consistent with the fact that it's a small number of people. It's like not to use too many sports analogies here, but think about baseball for a second, right? So you have players in baseball who abuse steroids, their steroid use, right? So if you have that, what would you say is the solution to that? Well, no one would ever say, well, the players, they're feeling a lot of pressure to hit home runs and to run really fast from base to base, so we should just stop keeping score because we don't want them to feel so much pressure. No, we would never say that. We'd say, let's crack down on steroid use. So the fact that a few people are making the wrong decision in education, the answer is not to stop testing 
because people are feeling pressure. Teachers, regardless of testing or not, feel pressure every single day because their jobs are enormous. They have the futures of 25 kids in their hands every day. They feel that pressure because of the enormity of their job. They're not going to do the wrong thing simply because you know, there, there are these things tied to it. It's just not the way that it is. We should have sanctions and consequences for people who are making the wrong decisions about cheating, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should get rid of the accountability system overall. Uh, I want to get to uh, back to teacher evaluations for just a second, because you talked about some of the external factors that teachers are dealing with, and no two situations are the same. Um, do you take into account whether or not a teacher has 30, 35 kids or 17 kids, in my wife's case, in her classroom when gauging that performance and, and that student growth? Is that something that needs to be accounted for? You know, one of the most important things that we did in DC when we were developing our, our teacher evaluation system was we engaged teachers in the process because the teachers agreed with us that the evaluation system that existed at the time was terrible, that they weren't getting anything out of it. Everybody wanted a change, um, but they were a little hesitant about what the change was moving to. So we engaged them in the process. And teachers gave us some very valuable and very credible information. So for example, I remember sitting at one meeting with teachers where somebody said, well, I, look, I don't mind being held accountable for how much my students grow academically, she said, but there are some things that we can't control. She said, for example, I just got one kid who entered my classroom three weeks before the test administration. She said, I can't, how should I be accountable for what that kid, you know, grew, how, how much that kid grew over the course of the school year when I haven't had them for the whole school year? That made a lot of sense, right? So what we did was in our evaluation system, we controlled for attendance to make sure that teachers weren't being penalized for kids who actually weren't in their classroom to learn every day. So you have to be able to take those kinds of things into consideration in a good model. Who's got the good model? Because we haven't decided on one here. We're about to pass a merit pay bill. Yeah. Um, so I would say this. I, I'd say that what we have done in DC uh, is a good start. Um, I'd say that Colorado has started to do some good work as well on these fronts. But here's, here's what I would caution against. Uh, there are lots of people who will say, because we don't have the perfect model, we cannot move forward. Uh, and what I would say is there is no perfect way to measure anything in life. You are not going to be able to come up with the foolproof model. In any other profession that exists, their evaluation systems are not perfect either. That should not stop us from moving forward. The way to move forward aggressively is to put a model in place that you believe, based on the research and, and, and other things, is better than what we have now. And I think everyone would agree that what we have now is not good at all. So move to something better and then be committed to iterating over time and to be learning from sort of the mistakes that you're making in the first couple of years to make it better as time goes on. But if you're going to take the stance, which I'm telling, to be honest, Michigan is sort of at the cusp of potentially being in this category where you know, we're going to have analysis paralysis of thinking about things so much that we can't actually move forward, that is, I think, much more problematic in the long term. Well, speaking of a paralysis, uh, Common Core stalled here in Michigan just yesterday in the budget talks. Uh, no money to for the implementation of Common Core. You talked about it in your speech just a little bit here. Uh, you, you talk about education not being a partisan issue, but this is a partisan issue. Uh, both this one that we talked about just a second ago, and yeah. of course the Common Core question. How do we get beyond Actually, it? Actually, it's not. It's a weird partisan issue uh, in that. Um, you have this um, kind of strange bedfellows effect happening with Common Core, right? So you have um, way right wing conservative Tea Party people who don't want federal mandates, so they're against Common Core. And then you've got some of the left wing teachers union folks who don't like accountability for their teachers, and so they don't want to move forward on Common Core. Uh, not too long ago, we saw on Capitol Hill, Rand Paul was high fiving the teachers union lobbyists because they had stopped something from moving forward. That's terrifying in my mind. <laughs> so I don't think this has to be a partisan issue at all. Yesterday, you had Jeb Bush here. He said, move forward with Common Core. I'm a Democrat. I'm saying move forward with the Common Core. I, th I mean, the bottom line is the Common Core makes good sense. You cannot have uh, apples to apples comparisons between your, your schools and your districts across the country to know which ones are doing the best unless you have a common uh, curriculum and a common uh, assessment. 
And so we need to sort of get over, again, all the, the federal government is mandating X, Y, and Z, and look at this from the perspective of what is going to move our country forward uh, and ensure that we are competing in the global marketplace, and Common Core has to be a part of that. Well, as you see, as you see by the little clock, our time is waiting here, uh, and, and I just want to give you one last opportunity to talk about where you think Michigan is uh, in terms of the types of reforms that you would like to see here in the state. Are you encouraged, discouraged? I'm actually very encouraged, and I will tell you very quickly that uh, about 12 or 14 years ago when I was running a national organization called the New Teacher Project, I came to visit Michigan. We visited with the Department, Department of Education and Detroit Public Schools, et cetera, and I came away from that trip and I called my colleagues and I said, there is no way we're going into Michigan. That place is not moving, there is just, I mean, there's such bureaucracy and, and they're just not reform oriented. I am happy to say that right now, as we look across the nation, Michigan in the last two years has been one of the most aggressive states on education reform. And I think the, the governor, the legislature leading the way, some of the things that the, the, the state has done uh, in terms of things like the EAA and taking over low performing schools, some of the work around um, teacher quality. These are some of the innovations and the initiatives that I think are gonna lead the rest of the country uh, for the next few years. Uh, so we are not where we need to be. There's still a lot of work that needs to get done, but in terms of what the trajectory uh, of Michigan looks like, I'm very, very hopeful for my birth state. All right, Michelle Green, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.